you made one error. You gave me momento first. So I have come with a very short story. It's of only two slides because my momento is with me. Why should I carry out my long presentation? This is the story of India beyond 2019. It can go to 2030, 2050, who knows when. If you focus a lot on this slide, you will see one white line going up quite nicely. And then focus even harder, then you will see some yellow, blue and green line trying to crawl up. The white line represents the share price of Maruti Suzuki since its listing in 2003. It's in Japanese yen, just to compare with uh, some of his peers. And all those yellow, blue, green, which you can hardly see, that belongs to some small Japanese companies like Honda, Toyota, Nissan, and Maruti's parent, Suzuki. So you should invest in India because Maruti delivers more return than all its worthy competitors put together. Goras have realized that, so they have been buying India. In Japanese, there is a proverb which says that if you do not enter the tiger's cave, you will not catch its cub. Very recently in Maruti's factory, a leopard entered. They were making motor cars, suddenly leopard entered, stopped making motor cars, evacuated employees, tranquilized the leopard, sent him back to the jungle and start making motor cars again. Such kind of thrill and adventure is missing in Japan. <laughs> in Toyota's factory, you can never get a leopard. It's only possible in Maruti. So once in a while in a market, in an economy, leopard will come. If you can manage it, then you will make gains like Maruti. And if you can't ride that leopard, then you will make gains like, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but since you are all my professional colleagues, and there are some people who normally I find on my side, they are today on opposite <laughs> side. <laughs> so I'll bore you with long story as well. There are certain peculiar challenges of India, which we all know, but we haven't really recognized it. The first big challenge for India is its diversity. We all know we are a diverse country. But look at the diversity which Mr. Modi is managing. Our smallest state, Goa, has population equivalent to Estonia. The largest state, UP, is bigger than Brazil. So when you are trying to run India, you are trying to run Estonia to Brazil together. If this diversity in population is not good enough, we have diversity in per capita GDP. Delhi, the richest state, is as rich as Indonesia in per capita GDP. And UP is poorer than Nepal. Normally when we heard of or hear of Nepal, we think of Gorkha as watchman. Next time, please remember there are 23 crore Indians who are poorer than those Nepalese watchmen. Please give respect to Gorkha. <laughs> we are a continent, we are not a country, and it's impossible for us to be managed. Every time we go to a foreigner, we generally ask him, do you believe in God? And 9 out of 10 people will reply, no. They are all atheists. And that's the answer we need. Because then our next answer is, sir, why don't you visit India? You will start believing in God. <laughs> if we are functioning, there must be someone at the top who is controlling our destiny. <laughs> the second challenge is that rest of the Indians are not as smart as Gujubais. <laughs> our official gold import and the quote-unquote word is official because I am sure after this statistics many of you will laugh at me. Kya Nilesh bhai, aadhi cheech to miss kar di. Our official gold import bill of last 17 years is 427 billion dollars. Our net foreign direct investment including retained earnings of Hindustan levers is just 294 billion dollars. 
as a country we are exporting capital out and then hoping that India will grow. It's like a person who has been admitted into hospital. The doctor prescribed him some nutrition and the other doctor started taking the blood. What will happen to his health? That's happening to India's health. Even the portfolio flows, the FII flows, is just about $244 billion. So we are exporting more money overseas when we need that money to be invested in India. This is where India is situated. In school and colleges, I'm sure none of you got educated that India is in Africa. I also went to the same school as yours. No one told me that India is in Africa. But when I became chartered accountant, I realized that our tax compliance is comparable to African nations. We are not worthy of saying that India is in Asia. Our tax to GDP ratio has moved from 10% to 12%. Most Asian nations are 16 to 22%. And most developed, developed nations are 35 to 40%. So you can see the gap in terms of this country. Most dishonest set of taxpayers most uneducated in terms of allocators of savings or capital, most diverse, and yet we aspire to become developed nations. How can that happen? The other challenge is job creation. Today, in Haryana, Jats are demanding government job reservation. In Maharashtra, Marathas are demanding. In Gujarat, Patels are demanding. And these are supposedly the better of caste, better of people. And yet, they have to demand jobs. So it shows what will be the situation in job market. Now, in this constraint, let's evaluate what lies beyond 2019. There are certain market challenges. Forget the country, let's talk about market because that's where we will make money. The first challenge which market will face is that Rajni Kant will retire. <laughs> Think about it. Rajnikanth is retiring. We associate Rajnikanth with Superman. He can do anything. Those of you who don't believe me, please go and watch Kala, you will realize. <laughs> In our market, Rajnikanth is central banker. They can create money out of thin air. They can make problems dissolve like Rajnikanth does in Kala. You remember 2008 October? One day Bairston died, next day Lehman Brothers died, thereafter Washington Mutual, thereafter AIG, and eventually Goldman Sachs' name was coming up. Suddenly US Fed, Ben Bernanke came, rescued everyone, and settled everything. 2013, we heard pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain. In 2008, companies were dying, 2013, countries were dying. Again, Mario Draghi came, rescued everyone like Rajnika. In Bank of Japan, they are doing this job for last 25 years. They are rescuing the country again and again, again and again. Now, all these central bankers are threatening to go on back foot or rest in 2018 onwards. US Fed has already cut balance sheets by $100 billion and they are threatening to go $100 billion a month. ECB is saying that I won't add $30 billion a month. Bank of Japan has so far not announced how much they will cut, but they are toying with that idea. Now, all of us have been beneficiary of rising tide because central bankers printed money, interest rates came down. Because interest rates came down, asset prices went up. This is the first year where we won't have put option of central bankers behind us. What will that lead to? In last you know, 20, year, 20 odd years, India today has received close to market value of $500 billion FII investment, $75 billion debt, about $425 billion market value equity. If 10% of that goes off, do you think we have capability to manage it? That will be the big question of 2019. The second is, slightly deteriorating macro because of rising oil prices. Higher oil prices reflects into widened current account deficit and depreciating currency. 
it can reflect into higher inflation or widening fiscal deficit having impact on interest rates. Interest rates will also be influenced by what US Fed is doing and for first time in a couple of years, US 10 year is threatening to cross 3%. And if all these things don't matter, then we can always trust Donald Trump to tweet something and it will create ruckus in our market. <laughs> so these are all the things which is restricting our macro. The top down doesn't look as inspiring as it was in 2017. On top of it, there is a credit squeeze emerging because of the way we are managing our banking crisis. 11 out of 21 PSU banks are out of business. They cannot give you credit even if you were their most loyal customer for more than 100 years. Under RBI's dictate of PCA, these banks have been stopped from extending credit. On top of it, there is tight liquidity in banking system, which is where short-term deposit rates have gone up by almost 2% point. Of the remaining 10, PCA, 10 PSU banks, six are into voluntary PCA because they know the numbers are such any day RBI will put them into PCA and today's environment when bankers are being caught and put behind bar who wants to take decision so 17 out of 21 PSU banks are not extending credit and PSU banks are 70 percent of India's banking system small and medium enterprise businesses especially when things are turning around on top of it, we have rupee which is continuously depreciating and we also have pretty high interest rates in the country vis-a-vis -vis our peer group. Again, this is restricting free flow of business in 2018 and 19 compared to the past. Our real interest rates are about 3%. There are very few countries where nominal interest rates are around 3%. And I'll give you an example of my cousin brother who was making jewelry in Mumbai, in SIPS. First chatka came when gold import duty was levied at 10%. So you import gold in India because we don't make any gold. You pay 10% import duty. But if his competitor was buying jewelry from Thailand under free trade agreement, there was zero import duty. So our government encouraged Thai jewelers to make jewelry and send it to India and discouraged Indian jewelers to make jewelry in India. My cousin brother still continued working. The second jatka came when he realized that his counterparts in Thailand were paying 4% interest rates. My cousin brother was paying 14% interest rates. So in a year's time, he was down 20% visa visas Thai peers. Still Lagero Munnabai continued working. Third jatka came when he realized that Thai currency appreciated, sorry, depreciated by 5% against rupee. Rupee appreciated by 5%. In about a year, he went uncompetitive by 25%. You can imagine what he would have done. He shifted all the machinery from his office, from his factory to Thailand, settled in Bangkok, and he's probably the only Gujjupai who settled in Bangkok only for making jewelry and not doing anything else. <laughs> this is how we have encouraged job creation in SME enterprises in India. We want Thai people to create jobs, not Indian people to create jobs. I hope you recognize this woman. Her name was Iman. She is Egyptian. She was Egyptian woman. Came to India in Saifi Hospital for lowering her weight. From 500 kg, she wanted to become normal woman. Doctors treated her, didn't work it out. Family was unhappy, took her back. And after going out of India, she died. Our NPS are like Iman, 500 kg. There's no harm in expecting NPS to be 50 kg. But will we proceed so fast to go from 500 kg to 50 kg that the whole banking system dies? Or will we go transitionary 500 kg to 400 to 300 to 200 to 100 to 50, whereby the patient's life doesn't get endangered? As of today, we are trying to go from 500 to 50 rather than 500 to 400 to 300 to 200 to 100 to 50. If all these challenges were not good enough, 
we have super challenge of 2019 election. The trailer is in 2018 December where Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Mizoram and Rajasthan are going for election. But the big drama is in May 2019. Why do we care for election? We care from market point of view because of past experience. 2004 market went up on India shining campaign. On the result they crashed 20% because communist party supported government had come to power. 2009 market went down earlier because there was no clarity on what kind of government will come. On election day it went up 20% because Manmohan Singh government came back with higher number of seats. 2014 was third scenario. In September 2013, Mr. Modi was appointed prime ministerial candidate for BJP. He was expected to get 180 seats. Sensex was exactly 18,000. Throughout the journey of September 13 to May 14, the probability of BJP getting higher number of seats kept on increasing. They surprised the market with 281 seats. Sensex was 28,100. There was absolute and perfect correlation between number of seats won by BJP and Sensex. Either Sensex divided by 100 was number of seats to BJP or number of seats to BJP to 100 was Sensex. At that level, now market is pricing BJP getting 350 seats. <laughs> now what will be 2019? Will it be like 2004 first up, then correction? Like 2009 first down, then up? 2014 first up and then further up or fourth scenario first down and then further down. <laughs> These are the four options. And what will be the best way to make money? There is only one sure way to make money and you have to really thank me for giving this advice. Please consult your family astrologer. <laughs> he is the only guy who will be able to guide you what will be the shape of government in 2019. If he's saying stable government, grab the equity. If he's saying coalition government, sell the equity. You can't go wrong. My guess is that all of us will need beyond astrology some advice. And my recommendation is that you can try to play contra. If market is pricing in a coalition government, take the risk. Despite losses on your portfolio, go ahead and invest before May 19. In case market is right and we did end up getting a coalition government, you will be down by another 5%. Big deal. But in case market is wrong and you get stable government, markets will be up 20-25%. Big gain. So the odds of making money is 1 is to 5 in IPL terminology. On the other hand, if market is pricing a stable government, take some profit. In case market is right, you will lose another 5%. You will re-enter 5% higher. But in case market is wrong, you will re-enter 30% lower. On the downside, price is 1 is to 6. Satta karna chahiye. There are two basic market challenges over and above what I mentioned. One, this is the year where there is a lot of supply. We are going to witness courtesy divestment, almost 2 lakh crore worth of papers. And all of you know when supply is high, what happens to prices. So don't expect a miracle like 2017 or 2016. Returns will be moderated simply because of the supply pressure. Second, corporate profitability is subdued. It has almost dived down by half from 7.1% in 2008 to about 3% in 2017 18. So suppressed profitability keeps valuation higher. But even if profit growth comes back, the valuations will start getting corrected. Now we really have to look beyond 2019. Election, who knows? All of us are anyway never going to vote, so we can't be blamed for what kind of government comes to us. <laughs> but if we have done some good work in last five years, it will help us no matter what government we get. So how many of you believe that in last four years, we have done some good work which will help us in next five years. Okay, so those of you who hasn't raised hand, this presentation is for you. I can understand why you didn't raise hands because probably you read 
something like this in September 2017. All of us read this news item for the first time in September 17 where kids were dying in dozens in Gorakhpur. Before this, this item never came. We are research analysts by birth. We wanted to go beyond the headlines, went to Wikipedia and searched what was actually happening in Gorakhpur. This is what was happening in Gorakhpur. In 2014, 16 kids were dying every day. 2015 became 19, 2016 became 17. In 2017, number of kids dying came down by almost 66%. From average of 17, it became 5.3. And yet, newspaper were carrying messages as if for the first time in Gorakhpur, kids were dying. In India, truth is, you know, relatively hidden behind the headlines. India is not as good as ZTV is trying to portray, and it is not as bad as NDTV, NDTV is trying to show. <laughs> it's somewhere in between. Now, let me give you some tidbits about how things are in India today. How many of you have seen Avengers Infinity Wars? One, two. I mean, all of you are rich enough, you could have seen this movie but hardly 10% of you have seen this movie. And yet this movie has collected 200 crore. 200 crore. Okay, let me give you another quiz. How many of you have seen Baki 2? Narayan Bhai, Ek? 2, 3. 3 or maybe 5 people. And I can assure you that half of this audience has seen Baki 2. And I will prove it to you now. <laughs> Baki 2 has collected more money than Bahubali 2. And in this room, how many people haven't seen Bahubali 2? <laughs> Himanshu Bhai, Pella Jene Bahubali 2 Jua, Kotak Ma Kaam Karin Sumal Se. Bahubali 2 is a far better movie. Yes, that is true. But Amari Jam ke office man joy lewan. Now, Baki 2 became as good as Bahubali 2 in terms of collection because it came on a special day. It came when there were four holidays of Good Friday weekend. Thursday was a holiday for some Jainti, then Good Friday, then Saturday, and then Sunday. There was immense pressure at home to go and do something. <laughs> I can assure you, half of you have gone and watched Baghi 2 without realizing that you have seen that movie. <laughs> Otherwise, in this audience, where five people haven't seen Bahubali 2 and five people have seen Baghi 2, and yet Baghi 2 and Bahubali 2 collections are same. <laughs> if people are watching movie, then Ache Din to hai. This is the first year where Bollywood film collection has crossed 1100 crores. It is up two and a half times in four years. And you have seen that cinema prices haven't gone up. In fact, they have actually come down. So more number of people are going to see movies. This is the auto sales number in May 18 and June 18. Maruti Suzuki sales up 26% in May. In June, it is up 36%. Royal Enfield, which sells bikes for one and a half lakh rupee and more, and the accessories cost another one lakh, so it is more expensive than Nano. It's up 23% and 18%. Tata Motors, we normally associate Tata Motor with trucks, but this is their sales growth of passenger vehicles, 58% and 54%. It's hitting half centuries for last two months. Bajaj Auto, 30% and 65%. Hero Motor Corp 11 and 13, Mahindra and Mahindra 12 and 25, Ashok Leyland 51 and 28, TVS 10 and 15, and Escorts which only sell tractors in rural India from 21 to 73%. Now this kind of auto numbers if you think are not achhe din, then aapke achhe din to jinge mein kabhi nahi aa sakte. <laughs> Maruti Balino has four month waiting period four month waiting period, despite that kind of sales growth. 
How many of you eat pizzas and burgers? No, no, there are some people like me who are not allowed to eat. And in last one year, have you increased your consumption of Domino's pizza and McDonald's french fries and burgers? Most of us have reduced because of pressure from home. Size badi rahi se dhyan rakho. And despite that, both Domino's pizza and McDonald's burger have same store volume growth of 27% and 35% year on year in last three months. That means there are more people who are visiting this outlets to buy pizzas and burgers and no one goes by buying pizza and burger in depression days. They all go there when they are happy about it. <laughs> this is aviation. Till 2014 March, we had whole of India, 371 planes. In this government's tenure, we will be adding 252 planes. 200 have already arrived, 52 will be arriving in next 12 months. In, last, in this government's tenure of five years, we have added 68% of total fleet, which we had in 2014 after 67 years of independence. So first 67 years, you have delivered 68% of that in just last five years. More importantly, we have ordered one and a half times that by way of order, 800 planes. Never ever in our history we have added this kind of plane. And which is why this is the first year where number of people traveling by aeroplane has exceeded number of people traveling by AC train. Now if this is not a good day, then when will you come to a good day? This is the reason why our air traffic growth is 20% plus in whole of this year. 20% plus. And this is the reason why New Delhi's Indira Gandhi International Airport is now more busier than John F. Kennedy International Airport at New York. We have about 371 plus 250 or 200, 600 odd planes. US has 22,000 planes. And yet, using those 600 odd planes, we are more busier than John F. Kennedy International Airport. Now, those of you who have raised hand they feel this is a chedin. Those of you who hasn't raised hands, they are saying that boss, isme kya hua? Now New Delhi looks like a railway station. <laughs> Look at the amount of hotel rooms which we are adding. In first 67 years, 97,400 hotel rooms. In last three years, 14, 15, 16, 17, we have added 27,960 rooms. About one third of what we added in previous 67 years. More importantly, all the hotel rooms constructed in any part of the world, 22% were constructed in India alone. The optimist says, wow, that's a great speed. Achhe din are here. The pessimist is saying that every other country which needed hotel room have already built. Now, other than India, which country will build hotel room? So we should be at 100%. The reality is that we need to work at this pace for next decade plus or maybe 15 years. Today, city of Shanghai has more hotel rooms than the whole of India. The city of Shanghai has more hotel rooms than whole of India. We need to maintain this pace for next 20 to 30 years to reach at the level where China is today. But since we were acquiring aircrafts, we were building airports, we were building hotel rooms, the number of tourist people who are coming to India has exceeded 1 crore for the first time in our history and they are spending 27 billion dollars in India. The worst part is that 2.2 crore Indians are traveling abroad. When a foreigner comes to India, he spends 1,10,000. When we go abroad, we spend 80,000 officially. <laughs> Those of you who are not laughing, they know the fact. There is fear that rural India is not doing that well. But for us, rural India's barometer is Hindustan Unilever. That stock is up 50% in last one year. It delivered 27% profit growth in December 17. And compound our misery, it went up 16, it delivered 16% growth in March 18. 
rural India seems to be doing well. There is a company called Sonalika, which is unlisted company making tractors. Last year, they their sales grew by 22% in whole year to cross 1 lakh tractors. But more importantly, in the month of March, their sales went up 80% year on year to touch 12,000 units. If they maintain that pace, this year they will be touching 1 lakh 50,000 tractors, which is 50% growth. And if you believe that's not possible, please look at escort sales growth. They went up 75% last month. None of us has bought tractor in last one year. That means these tractors are bought by farmers. And if farmers are buying tractor, they must be doing well. This is the microfinance institution's recovery. This is the NPA of Bharat Financial Inclusion, which is now becoming Indus in Bank. And quarter on quarter, their NPAs have come down. If farmers are paying back loan, if rural Indians are paying back their loan despite, fi despite farm loan waiver, there must be something good happening in rural India. GST, all of us have suffered from GST. It created you know, long nights for all of us. But now the benefits of GST are coming through. Travel time for truck between Delhi and Chennai was six and a half days. Today it is just about five days. A cousin of mine operates similar hall in Sion and another hall in, Pal in Khargar, Navi, Mumbai. Earlier, he was never able to shift material from Sion to Khargar because there was Oktroi Chek Naka. And Oktroi guys could take sometimes few hours to clear the truck, sometimes few days to clear the truck. Today, his official distance time between Khargar to Sion is just about two hours. Imagine how by creating GST, we are facilitating faster transport of goods, reducing fuel consumption, and making efficiency. What has GST done? It has helped chartered accountants immensely. <laughs> Pre-GST, there were 64 lakh official enterprises who were registered for paying taxes. Post-GST, that number is up 75% to 11.2 million. If your practice hasn't gone up by 75% post-GST, all of you are underperforming. <laughs> Income tax returns are up 60%. Pre-GST, 4.26 crore assesses were filing tax return, not paying tax, filing tax return. Now it is 6.84 crore. So your practice should have grown anywhere between 60 to 75%. If not, you are underperforming. This is the job creation. Lots of debate about jobs. In an absence of data, it was difficult to prove whether jobs are being created or not. But now, we have EPFO subscribers edition. This is real jobs because people have to pay EPFO or PF collections. From 3.28 lakhs jobs a month, now we are at 6.86 lakh. If we maintain this pace, there will be 84 lakh job creation in this year alone. On the road, lesser said the better. All of you have traveled across India. Mr. Junjunwala, you were in Madhya Pradesh and you were sharing how rural, land, rural roads are there in parts of Madhya Pradesh. So roads, we are building roads at a pace which we have never seen. On the railway, again, similar kind of work is being done. And let me put railway in context. We got Asia's first railway in 1853. It was built by Britishers. It was from Victoria Terminus then to Thane. The steam engine took 45 minutes to cover the distance between Victoria Terminus and Thane. Today, the same distance we cover in one hour and 15 minutes with electricity. <laughs> the world has gone from Belgadi to bullet train. We have come down from bullet train to Belgadi. Between 1853 to 1947, we, the Britishers built about 51,000 kilometers of railway track. They knew they had to leave India, yet they built 51,000 kilometers of railway track. From 1947 to 2014, we built 12,000 kilometers of railway track, 22% of what Britishers left for us. From being Asia's largest railway track, we became one half of China. What does this create? 
World over, 70% of cargo moves on railway track or sea route, which is cheaper. We push 70% cargo on road, which is 10 times more expensive than railway. That's how we became uncompetitive in the outside world. That's why foreign direct investments didn't come to India, because how will they move their cargo? How will they move their goods? And on top of it, we had our legendary bureaucracy in customs and excise department. We made our entrepreneurs run hurdle race where they should have, you know, used cycle or motorbike to run the race. And that's where we kind of remain behind. Now there is a dedicated freight corridor coming. It's a mind boggling project. It's connecting Delhi to New Bombay, Jain Pitti. It's connecting Ludhiana to Kolkata. And that's exclusive 3000 odd kilometer railway tracks only for carrying wagons, only for carrying goods train. Do you know that average speed of goods train in India is 25 kilometers? It's less than marathon runners who compete in standard chartered now TCS Mumbai marathon. If you actually ask those Kenyan and Ethiopian person to run with your cargo, they will outperform our goods train. <laughs> they will outperform our goods train because we carry on our railway track almost the entire population of Australia every day. Even when bridges collapse, we continue to carry them. <laughs> we need to build railway infrastructure to become competitive. Between 1970 to 2014, 44 years, we built 8,854 kilometers of railway track. In this five years, we are building almost 3,481 of 3,481 kilometers of railway track. That will probably make India competitive for 2019 and beyond. Our economy is related to oil. We spend on an average $110 billion in import of oil. God has been unkind to India. To the left of India, to all the Middle Eastern countries who don't deserve any oil, they have given plenty of oil. And they don't do anything with their oil but to export to people like us and take our $110 billion. To the right of India, there is gas in Bangladesh, Myanmar, Indonesia, and so on and so forth. But somewhere in the middle, God just forgot to give us the oil. And which is where our economy got linked to oil. Oil prices up, economy up, or economy down. Oil prices down, economy up. Now what are we trying to do to protect us from oil price vagaries? God has been kind to India, or actually super kind to India. Instead of polluting oil, it has given us plenty of solar power. But we never exploited it. Till 2014, total solar power capacity in India was 2,635 megawatt. Last year, 2018, we added 8,500 megawatt, about 3.6 times more than what we added in first 67 years. In last four years, solar capacity is up from 2,635 megawatt to 21,800 megawatt roughly about 8.26 times. If we maintain this pace, 10 years down the line, we'll be able to go to Saudi Arabia and tell, look, you give me oil right now, or 10 years down the line, I won't need any oil of you. I will run all my motor cars on battery using solar power. I won't require your oil. You can imagine what will happen to the oil prices 10 years down the line. In fact, there is a research report which says by 2050, oil prices will be zero. But for that to happen, we have to ensure that we keep on adding solar power capacity at this pace from here till 2050. Whether we'll do it or not will determine what happens beyond 2019. Power availability is available almost universally across India. Cement volume is up 20% plus. Today, if you are in Madhya Pradesh bordering Uttar Pradesh, you are unlikely to get five cement bags unless until you know the managing director or top management of cement companies there. The cement consumption is growing at a pace where most of these factories are running at peak utilization. That's the kind of cement demand which we are witnessing. This is the first year in my working career where during monsoon cement prices have been raised. Normally in monsoon cement prices come down because construction activity stops this is the first monsoon where cement prices are up despite rains. GST BONC is visible. The collections have crossed 95,610 crore. 
and I would like to take your opinion on something which we heard from Hasmu Kadia. He mentioned that gross GST collection is 5 lakh crore, input tax credit is 4 lakh crore, net GST collection is averaging 1 lakh crore. In his estimate, if we introduce invoice matching, then about 10 to 20 percent of leakage on input tax credit will be shut. That's 40,000 crore to 80,000 crore. I would like to take your opinion. How true is Mr. Hasmu Kadia? He is right? No? So what will be that range? 5 percent? Fair enough. That will determine what will happen to 2019. If it is 10%, that's 40,000 crore. It can change India completely. Sir, if you have to do a little bit of a pipe, then the pipe will be strong. Sir, you have to do a little bit of a text. Being a chartered accountant, you are smart enough to recognize this. <laughs> this is the first year where NPAs are getting solved. Obviously, invest insolvency board is trying to push things. There are judicial and other speed breakers, but at least on the headline basis, Bhushan Steel has already gone to Tata's. Electro still is moving into the hands of Liberty. Oh, sorry, Electro still is going to Vedanta and Adhunik is going to uh, Liberty. JP will go to Adani or Kotak. Binani Industries will go between Dalmia and Ultratech. For the first time, promoters are actually losing their company. Earlier, they were sitting in India and taking loans from banks to do evergreening. Now at least they have to go, but go to London to save themselves. So there are lots of things which is happening. I can keep on spending the entire night speaking what things are happening in the country to convince all those people who hasn't raised their hands that Ache Din are here. But let's come back to making money. Valuation wise, undoubtedly market is almost at the same level as it was in 2008. In 2008, Sensex corrected from 21,000 to 8,000. What's the chances of Sensex correcting from 35,000 to similar level down 60% because valuations are same? My suspicion is zero. In 2008, your profitability was 7.1% of GDP. Your interest rates were low. Credit growth was 25% plus. You had overheated economy and hence correction was visible. Today your real interest rates are highest in the world. Your credit growth is barely 10% plus. So economy is not overheated and your profitability is suppressed as PSU banks are writing NPAs and telecom sector is witnessing massive loss because of competition. And just for telecom and PSU banks losses, valuations looks quite reasonable. In fact, those of you who still don't believe me, please have a look at this picture. Can you recognize what this is? Just take a shot. It's not that difficult. Some mask, Narendra Modi, good. Whatever it is, it got sold for $110 million. <laughs> if someone in the world finds this is worth $110 million, please don't tell me Indian markets are expensive. We just need to find a person like this and sell our equities. <laughs> what we use as a thumb rule is Buffett's indicator of market cap to GDP. That's one fantastic ratio. In 2008, when Sensex was 21,000, it was at 149%. Today, it's averaging just about 90%. So we are not cheap like we were in October 2008, we are not as expensive as we were in Jan 2008. We are reasonably priced and which is why one thinks that 60% that correction in market is unlikely to come even if we end up getting a coalition government. The second thing why we won't see that kind of correction is because of investors like you. 
Prior to 2014, our markets were dependent upon Goras. They used to buy, markets went up, they will come to sell, markets will go down. This is the first few years where we have ability to stand against Gora. In first 20 years of my career, I always used to pray to the God every morning, Bhagwan, now I have to pray to the God, please ask FII to sell so that I can get mal. Otherwise I'll have to chase prices. There is this change which has occurred courtesy domestic mutual fund flows. Last year we got $20 billion in equity mutual funds. That's almost the size of the equity mutual funds in 2008. We are getting 10 year subscription in just one year. With that kind of money, we are able to stand against the FII. And that gives us confidence to say that we are unlikely to witness now 60% correction in case something goes wrong over there. No doubt, pitch has changed. 2017 was Indian cricket pitch. You could have played like T20 in a test match and still scored run. 2018 is South African cricket pitch. You have to play T20 also like a test match. There will be some bouncers which will hit your helmet, provided you have, have it. There will be some Yorkers which will crush your toes. But if you save your wicket, you will get opportunity to score run. The best way to summarize markets will be a movie like Mughle Azam. How many of you have seen it? Anyone who hasn't seen, I mean you have wasted your life. There is a dialogue in this movie where Prithviraj Kapoor tells Madhubala that Anarkali, Salim tujhe marne nahi dega aur hum tujhe jeene nahi denge. That's exactly our markets in Mughle Azam. The valuations are so high that it won't allow markets to rise from current level. If oil prices moves higher, unlikely market will go up. Credit squeeze is actually hurting Indian economy, especially in small medium enterprises segment. And political risk will continue to keep markets on tenter hooks, which will create its own doubt on the market. At the same time, if you continue to open your checkbook for Kotak mutual fund and other mutual funds, <laughs> will continue to stand against FII. Monsoon is likely to be good. The reservoir level data was supposed to come today. Hopefully that will be good enough to give indication for the rubby crop. And more importantly, as I mentioned, whether you look at auto sales, whether you look at airline traffic, whether you look at cement consumption, whether you look at NPA resolution, whether you look at discretionary purchase in entertainment of movie tickets in restaurants, everywhere there is a BONC which is visible. Economy is finally chugging along. And we are on course to get 8-9% GDP growth in days to come. Is there a past precedence which gives us confidence that when you follow this kind of strategy, there is, you know, pot at the end of the tunnel, there is rainbow at the end of the tunnel? Yes. If you look at last four years of Mr. Modi's work, he has definitely lowered inflation. From double-digit inflation, we are now at 4 and 5%. We are one of the emerging market where Reserve Bank of India is mandated under constitution to frame monetary policy in a manner which achieves 4% inflation target. Minimum government, maximum governance, the attempt has been made by the government, but it has not been as successful on the ground because of variety of reasons. But at least intention is clear that they want to automate things, they want to take away discretion. The markets are becoming freer, the rigid controls which were restricting India has been moving away. PSU divestment, intention is there, execution is pretty, pretty, pretty poor, Air India couldn't be sold. The quality of public sending is improving, the leakages are being plugged, Aadhaar, Jantan, Mobile, it's all coming together to ensure that the leakages are bare minimum. Fiscal prudence is there from 4.5% GDP a fiscal deficit to GDP, we are at 3.3 percent. Foreign direct investment, Mr. Modi has been going all over the world to attract as much foreign direct investment as possible. So these are all the reforms which they have been initiating. In the past, similar kind of reforms have been done by Margaret Thatcher. 
when she became Prime Minister of UK in 1979, majority of such reforms were initiated by her. Anything which had British, other than British Railway, was sold off by Margaret Thatcher, British Telecom, British Power, British Crash, British Airways. She cut the, uh, you know, government spending by removing lots of leakages. Majority of British uh, government servants were staying in, you know, large mansions. She sold off all those mansions and palaces. She even auctioned gardens and public places. She mandated Bank of England for targeting inflation. She unleashed financial sector reforms to make London now center of financial market. She cut expenditure. In her previous tenure, her name was Thatcher Thatcher Milk Snatcher because she stopped providing milk to kids in the English public school like we run our midday meals. English men were running midday milk for their kids before Thatcher. And she removed it saying that English people, English kids should drink milk at home, not at school. And that's where she was called Thatcher Thatcher Milk Snatcher. So a lot of the work which Mr. Modi is trying to do are already envisaged by Margaret Thatcher's regime. And in her tenure, if you see UK, 11 years, first the bitter medicine came, growth plummeted, but thereafter growth recovered. And post Second World War, they had the highest ever economic expansion. From a market point of view, FTSE all share index multiplied five times in 11 years. And Sensex has not even doubled in last four years. You can imagine what lies beyond 2019, provided we can continue with this kind of reform, provided we can continue with this kind of growth oriented policies. The only risk is that UK elected Thatcher thrice. And we have May 2019 in front of us. Now, let me take you to the last slide. Okay. What's the risk for 2019? What's the risk beyond 2019? It's the soccer season right now. And the only risk is risk of self-call. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard about Padma Vibhushan Fali Sam Nariman. Most of us would have heard about him. How many of us have heard about Gulam Dastagir? Uh, hardly anyone. Gulam Dastagir was station master in Bhopal in December 1984. Those were the days when there was no 24 by 7 TV, which tells you that the bridge has fallen. Those were the days when there was no WhatsApp, so none of us can be warned that there is a gas leak at Union Carbide plant. There was no siren buzzing in Union Carbide warning people that there is a deadly gas leak. Union Carbide's factory was nearer to railway track and in the vicinity of Bhopal railway station. Gulam Dastagir was assistant station master on that fateful night. Smelling air he realized that there is something wrong. He took the call of releasing a train which was stationed at Bhopal railway station 10 minutes earlier compared to its departure time. His own subordinates warned him that by releasing train 10 minutes early, you could be sacked. And yet, Gulam Dastgir, without 24 by 7 television, without WhatsApp message, without any siren buzzing took the call that there is something wrong in the air. Let me release the train 10 minutes prior to its departure time. Probably for the first time in the history of Indian Railway, a train departed before its departure time. <laughs> he also took the call of stopping all the trains which were coming into Bhopal. And if he hadn't done that, thousands of passengers would have died because they would have passed through the deadly gas clouds. As the night progressed, more and more people were visiting Bhopal railway station. He kept on arranging transportation for them to send them to hospitals. Throughout the night he stayed and didn't run away from Bhopal unlike many other government servants. By being exposed to deadly gas, his own health got impacted and throughout his life he suffered. 
He also didn't bother about his family members who were staying near Union Carbide Factory. And for all the great work done by Gulam Dastagir, we grateful Indians don't even remember him. He didn't get any Padma Vibhushan. The Padma Vibhushan was given to Falisam Nariman who actually, who actually fought for Union Carbide. He used all his brains to protect Union Carbide from world's largest ever industrial disaster. And for that great work, we offered him Padma Vibhushan. This is the self-called tendency of Indians. We did it many a times in past and which is why we are still an emerging nation, developing nation and not a developed nation. If we stop making self-calls, I have no doubt that beyond 2019 there is great opportunity. If we continue to make self-call, then despite having Ronaldo and despite having Messi and despite having all other stars, we won't be able to win this match. Hopefully, Indians will not make as many self-goals. If I have to summarize, there is strong foundation for growth for work done by various governments in the past, not only last four years, but before that. Rajiv Gandhi government introduced and set up base of telecom and IT. Manmohan Singh Narsimha Rao combined delivered liberalization. Atal Bihari Vajpayee delivered golden quadrilateral. This government has also done variety of things. So there is a foundation which is laid for India. And if we don't score self-goal, I think beyond 2019, there is rainbow at the end of the tunnel. We expect India Inc's earnings to rebound. The profitability will be quite impressive. The market might look a little expensive on a P ratio basis, but on a market cap to GDP, we are fairly priced. It remains attractive for long-term investors. However, if we end up scoring a self-goal in 2019 election, then these bets are off for a couple of years. These are all the risk factors which we are supposed to disclose. Iman Shubhai, I'm following my job. <laughs> but uh, thank you for your attention.